In my 16th year, it became apparent to me that the story I will be writing for the rest of my life would be the manic depressive story. In my 15th year, I was diagnosed and going stark mad, and by my 17th, I realized that both of the above statements would be totally irrelevant to the life I would be living today. So, hello. Most of you know me, but my name is Katie G. I am a senior, I am 17 years old, and I love writing and cats a lot. <laughs> I dance and belt out to Taylor Swift on Fridays. It's kind of this accidental tradition between me and my friends. And I'm not very good at being cool, regardless if I'm talking to one person, let alone a room full of people at TEDx. I am also a survivor of mental illness. This is a story of courage. Everything changes when you get to high school. When the stakes get higher and the cards are decked up against you, it's easy to feel lost. I felt like the world was shifting beneath my feet, and I was the only one standing still. Everyone else around me was running towards this vague, ambiguous line, finish line called the future. They had already gotten a head start on me. Early on, I struggled with suicidal thoughts and self-harm. I looked for solace in so many things. Religiousness, rejecting religion, French philosophy, sports. I just, I couldn't find it. But I made my way to a normal, and that's what mattered, right? It's not like any of those things could happen again. I'm wrong. Scient it's scientifically proven that things change in adolescence. I mean, puberty? Half, but half of all lifetime cases start at a of mental illness start at age 14. Four million children and adolescents suffer from a diagnosable mental illness, but depression makes up the most of it. And we know depression all too well in this community. After all, there was Jackie. There were the infamous Palo Alto suicides of 2009 and 2010. I hate how they're all lumped together. The Palo Alto suicides, it just, it leaves a bad taste in my mouth. Meanwhile, I'm just a teenage girl lost in a sea of statistics. Around the time I ended my freshman year, I fell apart yet again. It was quietly. Somehow, some way, I knew I was broken and I wanted to crazy glue this crazy mess back together. I mean, if I could do it once, heck, I could do it again. I never really fixed myself, though. I didn't accept myself. I didn't accept the demons I faced. I just, I knew how to deal, but I didn't know how to live. I struggled with a lot of anxiety. You know, the usual, the pre-college, pre-graduate school, pre-life is happening anxiety that comes with this mid-midlife crisis. Anxiety isn't uncommon in environments like our own. In a recent PhD study on high-pressure college preparatory schools, it was found that 84.6 students reported that, that homework had a major effect on their stress level. Personal drive, 65.5. College goals, 57.7, and the expectations of their parents was 51.1%. I don't have much to say about this, other than I don't think it should really be shocking. Our own Honors Council surveys have found that we haven't, that the pressure to cheat is driven by the pressure to do well in this rigorous environment. We, as the Harker community, have an unfortunately high stress level. And I want to say that my parents' expectations didn't influence me, but they did, or rather, what I thought their expectations were. My mother is an immigrant from the Philippines. She made it through the death of her father at 16, practically raised the majority of her eight other siblings, and put herself through business school. My father is a first-generation, proud, Sacramento-born man who put himself through engineering school across the country, and they met at business school. Did I mention that that business school's name was Harvard? 
When you have high achieving parents who have high profile jobs and everything is up in the skies for you, you have no choice but to shoot for the stars. And it gets worse when you go to a school where everybody is so amazing at what they do, creating phone apps left and right, going to great schools, winning contests and scholarships. You feel this collective pressure on your back, this overwhelming fear that you're not good enough, that you'll never be good enough. I was diagnosed with anxiety ending my freshman year. I was scared of my diagnosis, and I was scared of myself. This would be the beginning of a long relationship of being absolutely terrified of the person I was, the illness I was. Eventually, my family came to the conclusion that it was something more than anxiety. There was something in the red-eyed, wet face I'd return with from the bathroom to the restaurant table before the main course was served. There was something in the way I couldn't get myself out of bed, or the days when I'd lock myself in my room, scribbling furiously in a notebook because I had so many great, splendiferous ideas. Bipolar II is a unique illness characterized by mood swings that shift in between hypomania and depression. Hypomania is an elated feeling of euphoria and hyperactivity. Meanwhile, major depressive episodes in bipolar are generally more, much more severe than your typical unipolar depressed patient. At least 25 to 50 percent of bipolar patients will attempt suicide at least once. Being bipolar or manic depressive is scary. I was a person I didn't know, and when you're a teenager, and you don't even know who you are, I was either hypomanic or depressed. And in the time in between, I was just confused. I was never Katie. I was just sick. So we went to the doctor again, and added on to the diagnosis was unipolar depression. I was put on Zoloft, but the diagnosis was wrong, and life just got worse. When someone who is bipolar is put on antidepressants, they flip a person, triggering a hypomanic or manic episode. The process is sped up. As they fall out of hypomania, they spiral into a depression, and that is exactly what happened to me. It made my curves grander. My highs got higher and my lows got lower, and I wondered if something was wrong with me if it were my hormones, if there was something wrong in the way I was living, or even if my parents had done something wrong in raising me. Maybe I was the problem. I didn't really know what was going on, and neither did anybody else, really. The lack of education around mental illness is one that astounds me. 21% of children and adolescents suffer from a mental or addictive disorder, and it kills me that no one will talk about this. When a child is diagnosed with mental illness, the parents are ashamed. My parents were no better. We were all victims to the stigma around mental illness. And that's a common misconception, by the way, that having a mental illness or struggling with mental health means something is wrong with you. And the child, the child is embarrassed. I mean, I was too. I felt so lonely. I was hungry for answers, but mostly I need someone to talk to. The mental illness community doesn't have a designated meeting time at long lunch. It doesn't have a classroom or a place of worship. It's a scavenger hunt in a way. People are so ashamed to talk about this that you only discover it when you're incredibly close to them. I felt like I had nobody. We should all have someone to talk to. We're all affected by mental health, but somehow society has attached the stigma to mental illness. I was embarrassed for being so messed up, and I didn't want to be a burden on anyone else. The moment I told my then friends what I was, who I was, that's what they made me believe I was, a burden. 
I was bullied for being bipolar and being crazy and having anxiety. My friends called me a crazy bitch behind my back and through Facebook messages, actually. They laughed that I took medication and in one particular incident claimed I ruined the party by having a breakdown in the bathroom. I cannot stress the importance of having friends who understand what you're going through or can at least empathize with you, especially when you're going through something like this or even when you're going through the ordeal of life in general. I don't know how I'd be able to survive my senior year, the hectic and crazy year as it is, if it weren't for my friends. If, child, if children are bullying their friends for mental illness, who can say where the stigma will end? Being attacked for my mental illness during my sophomore year was absolutely traumatic. Again, I felt lonely. I felt like I had no one to talk to. But somehow, my sophomore year wasn't over yet. I was heavily medicated with lithium at this point. It was the right medication for bipolar disorder, but not the right medication for me. It truly was an effective mood stabilizer. I lost the lows, but I also lost the highs. I was numbed. I felt nothing. And in addition, lithium deeply impaired my ability to think. Medication casted a heavy fog over my life and I wanted out. The summer of 2014 was my Indian summer. I will remember it today as one of the best memories I have and will cherish. Attending Brown's pre-college program in Rhode Island, I took classes that I was generally interested in. I made friends in my dorm and in my classes, and there are people today whom I can trust the world with. And I am so fortunate to have met all of these people and learned so many things. But it was that very same summer, my confidence trumped my rationality. That's what it was, really. Being very confident. I felt like I had grown out of my medications. Like I could fight these demons on my own because it was a matter of my brain chemistry. It was just me. Screw the armor. Screw the cavalry. Forget the horses. I could do this on my own. So without my doctor's approval, I went off my medications and I suffered an episode of extreme hypomania followed by a severe depression. <clears throat> hypomania is not easily described. It is the feeling of stars washing over your toes and galaxies dancing upon your fingertips. Depression is hopeless and helpless, confused and dangerous. It was natural to fall the way I did, to slip backwards into an addiction to hypomania. And in spite of this pandemonium, I wrote, I cannot stress the importance of adhering to your passions and chasing your dreams. It sounds so cheesy and angsty, but I wrote pages and pages of my story. It was writing that would help save me. Yes, it would be my family, my true friends, and my passions that would give me solace, but at the end of the day, it would be me, the, the stranger whose body I'd been living in for over 10 years, the person I would learn to love, who would give me strength, who would save me. In the months as I went back on medication, I still suffered a heavy depression. That's the thing about being treated for mental illness. It's not an exact science. They can put you on the pills. They can slow your heart rate down. They can get rid of those racing thoughts at night, but they will never be able to erase the memories. They will never be able to Get rid of the faces of the demons you faced the night before. So at this point, I had two choices, the hospital or this aftercare program. I chose the latter, definitively telling myself I wasn't that bad. But as I attended the program, I met others who had struggled as I did, and I finally realized how sucky my situation was. I finally understood that it's okay to be sick. 
even if your illness is one that you fight on the inside. It was there that I found a more suitable medication plan, and the program helped my family as well. My parents never for a day forgot to love their child. They never hated me. They hated who I was becoming, this person consumed by her illness. My mother hated how I would lie in bed, hoping that the next breath I took would be my last. My father hated how he couldn't solve the equation as to what was wrong with me. They hated the illness. They hated that I was becoming the illness. I was off the lithium, but I still couldn't think straight. I could never stay in one place for long periods of time, but now I couldn't even read long passages. I was diagnosed and treated for ADHD. After seeking treatment, I witnessed tremendous results. But like my conceptions around mental illness, my thoughts on learning disabilities were seriously narrow-minded. I always assumed that ADHD is something for hyperactive little boys who watch too much reality television and play too many video games. It's difficult for girls to be diagnosed with ADHD, and it's estimated that half to three-fourths of all women with ADHD, or approximately four million women, go undiagnosed with it. While boys are hyperactive and impulsive, girls are disorganized. They are scattered and introverted. For me, it caused a lot of anxiety and depression. In a school full of geniuses, I genuinely felt stupid. I could barely remember to bring my TI calculator or bring my homework to class. So, if you take anything from this talk, let it be this. It's okay to not be okay. That could be embroidered on a pillow or perhaps caption an overexposed picture on Instagram of the beach. But really, <laughs> mental illness is not a weakness. The tenacity you form in the fires of going through something like this, it's unique. The struggles are a part of what makes us us, but know that it isn't everything. It's how we overcome them. Know that you are never alone in this fight, because I assure you, you are not the only one. As lonely and cold as the world may seem at times, there is a big enough hope for all of us. Don't be afraid to talk to someone, or to reach out, or to get help, because it's so important to chase your passions down that long, winding road called life. Today, the story I write will no longer be the manic-depressive story. For I am not my illness. I am not my struggles. I am an individual with a name, a story, passions, a history, and a personality. Staying myself was part of the battle, and I have declared war. The story I write today, and for the rest of my life, will be the story of me. Thank you. Thank you.